Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Lake Norman Chamber of Commerce Focus Friday. Uh, we're very excited to have everybody today at Morn talking to Auditor Beth Wood. Uh, we're going to start off, though, with a presentation from Deepa Johnson, who is our presenting sponsor with Novant Health. Deepa, what's going on at Novant in Huntersville? Good morning. Um, so we just held our pediatric emergency department groundbreaking last Friday. Um, it's going to be a wonderful new addition to the North Market. Um, currently, if we do have any pediatrics coming through, we have to refer them, you know, straight to Presbyterian or to Atrium and Uptown. So um, with this, we can actually treat patients that come to our emergency department right there. We see about 5,000 patients um, yearly. And so this is going to be a kind of a safe place for them, you know, as safe as you can make it, you know, going to the emergency department, but they're going to have their own entrance. Each of the um, uh, rooms will be like NASCAR themed um, in honor of all of our donors. Our, present, our biggest sponsor is the Mountain, Martin Truex Foundation. So we are very excited about that um, new development. As far as COVID's going, we're starting to see a little bit of a decrease in our hospital systems, um, system-wide um, with patients coming in. So this is going to be good, but of course we are going into flu season. And um, so we're probably going to see some more flu cases coming through. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the, the presentation. Um, and also thank you for Novant for, for what you do in our community. You're a great regional partner. Now it's my pleasure to welcome the 2021 Public Policy Chair, Jeff Tart, who will moderate today's program. Jeff, it's your show. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Deepa, for the update as well. Uh, today with us, we have a very distinct honor and pleasure of having the North Carolina State Auditor Beth Wood with us. Uh, Madam Auditor, it is a pleasure to have you here. As background, she's uh, born and bred North Carolina and Tar Heel through and through. Uh, I believe ECU, uh, accounting, CPA, our lead uh, financial officer in the entire state. Uh, this is our watchdog financially over all things North Carolina. I've had the distinct pleasure and, and full disclosure to work directly with Beth on a number of initiatives, and we serve on the state's IT oversight board together currently. I will tell you that, you know, people talk about you reading the paper that uh, Phil Berger is the most powerful politician in the state of North Carolina. Well, it's a toss up, really. Uh, because I'm going to tell you that Madam Auditor is right there and carries her own weight in that regard. She is respected and trusted by everybody across all points of the aisle. And uh, full disclosure, um, I voted for you every time you've run for office. Uh, <laughs> you are an amazing lady with an amazing skill set and an amazing ability to get into the details and get to the heart of an issue. And that's a little bit about what we hope to get into a little bit today is talk about uh, the auditor's office and the initiatives and things you do. Because I'm thinking a lot of people, even in the business community, aren't completely aware of that. So with that, uh, Beth, again, personally, as a friend and colleague, I'm glad that you were able to join us. And I'm going to give you the floor and then we'll uh, get into a little bit of, as I like to say, my best Charlie Rose imitation and kind of get into a conversation about various topics. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Jeff. Um, great to be with you all this morning, um, and, and it's great to serve the citizens of North Carolina as a state auditor. So um, just talking about the state of the state, if you wanted to know the state of the state, um, I would tell you that it depends. State of North Carolina is spending, um, before COVID monies, about $46 billion a year um, in, to run our state government. And I, I say the number because I want to break it down a little bit for you because um, as business owners, as people so entrenched in the business world, it's important for you to understand where this money is coming from. About $13 billion is coming in as state income taxes that we all pay. And then another $8 billion in sales taxes every time you make a purchase coming into the state of North Carolina, another $2 billion in gas tax, and if you own your own business, another billion dollars in corporate taxes. Within that 46 billion is $21 billion coming from the federal government in the form of grants, Medicaid, food stamps, monies to build our roads and our bridges, 
monies for um, students to go to student financial aid to go to our universities and our community colleges. Um, and so the state of North Carolina has nobody to watch over how those dollars are being spent, how they're being accounted for, and how they're being reported, except the Office of the State Auditor. So that is our job. And so you talk about the state of the state, are we in good shape financially? Yes, uh, our bottom line looks good. Our bottom line looks so good among other uh, policies and procedures and sort of protocols the state of North Carolina has in place through our general assembly, through our state treasurer um, and our bottom line, the state of North Carolina is only one of 14 in the nation with a triple, triple A bond rating, which means we have the best credit rating um, that anyone, any state can get, which means that when we borrow money, we pay the lowest interest rates in the nation, which is critical because the state of North Carolina, as all other states, we borrow billions of dollars. So that's very important. So our bottom line, does it look good? The General Assembly of the years has helped um, the state of North Carolina dig out of the unemployment um, hole that we were in. Um, we have dug out of and put back monies in a reserve rainy day fund. So from a financial perspective, the state of the state, we look good. Um, the other piece I would tell you though, are we accomplishing everything that the state of North Carolina should accomplish with all the dollars that we're spending? The answer to that question, and this is back to audits that I've done, the answer to that question would be no. I'll point out an audit that we did with uh, for the, on the North Carolina Department of Transportation. They overspent their budget by $742 million. And I wanna kind of put back in there, back up a little bit, um, of these $46 billion, about 32 state agencies, our top three, our biggest three state agencies are Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Public Safety, and DOT is the third largest agency spending of our tax dollars um, in state government. So we have DOT has a $6 billion budget. They are building, repairing our roads, our bridges across the state. They're maintaining our um, shoulders of the roads. Um, doing a lot, and they have 14 divisional offices across our state um, to uh, maintain and build these roads. So we performed an audit on 2019, finding that they had overspent their budget by $742 million. More importantly than that, they ran out of cash. The Department of Transportation has a floor by which they cannot spend beneath. They spent well beneath that floor. And for all practical purposes, they ran out of cash. They had $144 million of payables on the books at the end of 2019. This money was owed to pavers, architects, and engineers. Many of them complaining to the state treasurer that they could not meet payroll because of the money that the state owed them and in particular, Department of Transportation. So we performed an audit. We showed that there was very little oversight um, of how, of watching over, here's your spending plan for the year and what are, how are you actually spending against it? It's a budget. It includes more than appropriations, but for all practical purposes, it's a budget. And so they weren't watching their 14 divisional offices to make sure that their budget to actual was in accordance with the plan. We also found out that the 14 divisional uh, highway division offices, once they got to the end of the year individually and against their budget, they would spend against next year's budget. Now think about it, a budget has nothing to do with cash. A budget just is a forecast of what you think your revenues and expenditures are gonna be, but they were spending against next year's budget. And which means there was no cash to go with it. Therein lies why we ran out of cash. And then we found that their forecasting methodology was so antiquated. Um, an example was they overspent their preliminary engineering fees by $194 million for that year. And they were basing that preliminary engineering fee for the year on last year's spin. Well, preliminary engineering is a very project by project by project specific cost 
you know what you're going to build next year, what you plan to build or repair next year. So I just take all these projects and add it up and see which ones have got preliminary engineering fees. So again, critical, critical to the state of North Carolina, while our bottom line looks good, individually DOT um, doesn't have great numbers for the General Assembly, doesn't have great numbers for the Board of Transportation to make decisions. And right now, right now, when it comes to the maintenance of our roads, they are taking what the General Assembly budgets gives them as a budget. And then they are spreading that out and repairing what roads they can. I am not sure that the General Assembly or the Department of Transportation's Board of Transportation actually know what the entire maintenance and repair number looks like because all we're doing is repairing and maintaining a certain amount because of all the money that they get. Another audit that we did, I think is critical to use maybe not well in the end and indirectly, it will be as a business person, but we looked at the Department of, um, Department of Instruction and we looked at, um, they received monies to run a summer school program they received about $75 million of the first tranche of money that came in from the feds. And they were to run a summer school program um, across the state for that year end where we first got into COVID that last quarter of um, 2020. And they were supposed to run a summer school program for any kids that were struggling at the end of the year and then had to go all virtual. And we found there was $75 million on the table. DPI only put out about 30 million and there was no oversight to, do, to, to identify the children that needed that summer school. Did they get into the summer school? And once they got into the summer school, did it make a difference in their grades? Because they were put up to the next grade. So again, stepping back, the state of the state, if you look at our bottom line, we look great. If you dig into the details of what we're accomplishing with um, the money that we have, and then you think about all the federal money that's coming in the door, we're not so great. So very quickly, Senator Tart, there is a, a sort of a quick recap of state auditor, a couple of audits we're doing and, um, and the state of the state. All right, thank you, Beth. Well, let, let's jump into it. Let, let's go ahead and I'm going to back up before we jump into these because this raises a pile of questions we can jump into accountability, how do we track these, your thoughts on how we address these kinds of issues. But besides the audits, can you give us an overview what kind of the responsibilities charge uh, responsibilities are for the state auditor's office? Absolutely. So we have um, sort of sort of two, three issues um, or three um, buckets, if you will, of what we do. So we perform financial statement audits. We perform a financial statement audit on the state of North Carolina. Uh, all the, all the uh, agencies have put together into one big set of financial statements. That, those are the CAFRs? Yes, that's the CAFR. And, and it's also, we, we, um, the, the universities put together their CAFRs as a comprehensive annual financial statement. This is what we believe we look like financially healthy or not. Uh, the state of North Carolina puts one together, every university um, puts one together and every community college. We audit those numbers so that the creditors, and these are the users of the financial statement audits are creditors for universities and the state of North Carolina so that when they run financial ratios to decide if they wanna loan you money or not, they can depend on those numbers. So I'm rendering an opinion on whether or not those numbers are reliable and credible. And then we um, perform compliance audits on all the federal grant money that's coming in the door. Are the students who are receiving student financial aid, are they eligible? If they drop out of school, did we stop the money and get back any that they might owe us? For uh, DOT, we look at um, the paving of our roads. Um, the, the federal government's very particular, you supposed to use asphalt of a particular grade you're supposed to use uh, the gravel that goes underneath of a particular grade. And are you testing it before you lay it down? Because if not, the roads won't hold up. Medicaid um, uh, recipients, are you eligible? 
doctors and dentists and in-home healthcare providers, are you eligible to serve these people? So we're auditing from a compliance perspective. We're doing performance audits. That's the two that I just described with DOT and DPI. Now we're looking for waste and abusive spending. We're also performing information technology audits. We are looking at heavily cybersecurity. Um, are we geared up for it uh, in the university systems and the state of North Carolina? And then last but not least, these are not audits, these are investigations, but we receive complaints probably about 800 a year, about 120 of those are, um, once we triage them, are true investigations that somebody needs to be looking into, depending on the jurisdiction. We don't always have jurisdiction to do that, um, but we um, are doing investigations where we are looking at the more specific allegation versus an entire organization. And I will add to that, the state auditor's office has subpoena power. So if somebody tries to keep me out of their agency, their organization, tries to keep information or records away from me, I sign my own subpoenas and they hold up in court like any other subpoena that's court issued um, in order to gain access to people and records that I need to look at. It's amazing. So give us a general idea. What's the size of your staff, the types of skill sets you look for in your uh, staff and kind of your overall budget? I have an overall budget. I am appropriated about $16 million. I get another couple of million in receipts supported. Um, I have 146 staff members. 126 of them are um, auditors. <clears throat> you must have a four-year degree and 24 semester hours of accounting before you can be hired by the state auditor's office. You don't have to have your CPA but in order to be promoted up through the ranks and make it to deputy, um, you need your CPA to get there. A CFE won't get you, you need your CPA. Um, we get uh, students, obviously, from the universities. I target uh, UNC Charlotte, NC State, UNC Wilmington, and ECU um, for accounting students. I can't recruit from all universities, we just don't have the time. So we hit on those with the best accounting um, programs uh, in their universities. Um, we bring them in at a very low level, ASA1, straight out of college. Sometimes it'll be somebody into a second career, they'll come in as ASA1. I put them through a 30-day boot camp. They work on two audits that have already been completed. We run them through the entire gambit, start to finish of an audit so they can see what they look like. One is a financial statement audit, one of them is a compliance audit looking at grants. <clears throat> and I do this before I ever put them out on the team. And then there's on the job training. We have ASA ones, the most inexperienced. Then we have ASA twos, ASA threes, work your way into a supervisor, which looks as over, it's over a team. A manager is over several teams and a director is over several managers. Then I have directors and on up to myself. I am, uh, over a hundred years of the state auditor's office being um, in place, I am only the second CPA to ever sit in that seat. Yeah, it's an important criteria to say the least. The, um, you know, we've talked about all the governmental bodies and agencies and where the federal money goes. Do you ever get involved with private enterprises auditing or reviewing, particularly when they're given taxpayer dollars or federal grants or... Does that fall under your purview or not? It does if they're being paid with um, state or federal monies running through the state of North Carolina or just state appropriations. If they're being paid with state monies, I do have the ability to do some work. Um, I can look at their contracts. I can look at their deliverables in accordance with that contract. But can I get inside the business itself and audit it? No. Gotcha. The... Um... From that perspective, you mentioned doing investigations and you get 800 requests. How do you prioritize and determine where you are going to assign resources? Um, for those, there is a priority. There's the A, B, and C that we assign to them. They have criteria, um, but given the egregiousness, um, again, if it's um, somebody that's circumventing the rules and procedures versus somebody who's actually embezzling or stealing, um, the embezzlement or the stealing is, is the highest priority. 
The second thing is if there is uh, a chance that we have to get in and seize computers, hard drives, records before somebody can destroy them, um, again, that lends itself um, to a priority. And so we are reprioritizing every week those investigations that we are headed into. Gotcha. So for the state auditor's office in a generic sense, for your office to be successful, what are kind of your critical success factors? Having um, a very talented staff. Back in the day when I went to work at the state auditor's office, um, we, were, we were hiring whoever the CPA firms didn't hire. And so we were taking the leftovers, if you will. Now we recruit um, more intentionally and I'm looking for the best and the brightest. So I need critical thinkers. I need people who um, are passionate. They, they want a work-life balance, but they care about their, how they grow, how they develop. Can they be the best they can be? So number one, I need great staff. Um, and I need to be able to pay them. The General Assembly has been very kind to me in getting my salaries up to a point now that I am competitive with all other state agencies. The universities and the uh, controller's office used to steal my auditors left and right. Now, not so much because I pay better than they do. And then great planning sessions. We spend a lot of time planning and determining the objectives of the audits that we do, because once you nail those down and you stay focused on that objective, it's gonna produce irrefutable findings. And that's what I promised the General Assembly and the governor is irrefutable findings. The other thing, um, Senator Tart, that I um, am adamant about, and that's the best training offered in the nation. I look high and low for the topics that we must be taught if it's uh, sampling, if it's uh, data analytics, if it's internal controls, no matter the topic, I look high and low across the nation and hire the best and the brightest. And then it's a requirement that the staff that work with me, that they use that information, it directly affects the audit and the audit work, the different types of audits that they do. So hiring the best and the brightest and training them. That's why I put that boot camp in place. It was expensive to establish it, but once I've established it, those um, staff members coming out of that boot camp hit the ground running when they go on a team and it doesn't hold up my supervisors. So very talented people to begin with and then training them well. And then I have a very, very stringent performance evaluation process. We, all the way up to me, there's a very stringent process for evaluating the staff. If they are not performing like they should, they're put on a um, remediation program. And if they don't make it, they can't work with the state auditor's office. Interesting. Beth, if you can share with us uh, without breaching any confidences, I guess, what are the top kind of issues, projects, initiatives you guys are digging into right now or concerns that you have? Wow. Uh, there's several, um, and it's not necessarily prioritized in this order. It's, it's all got equal weight right now. We're looking in um, to the um, Employment Security Commission. Um, again, lessons learned. Why? Why were we so buried, and why did we re not, not react faster to the unemployment needs of the citizens across this state? Um, also, and what happened there just quickly, if you don't mind, it's not out yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. A sneak preview. It's not out yet. <laughs> okay. Well, I can tell you, let me just say this COVID won the whole reason that we had the issues. COVID was, that's what everybody said. Can't get it out too many, but we, we weren't, we weren't functioning real well before COVID hit. So there you go. All um, right. And then, um, DPI. Um, we, there are concerns by legislators for um, kids that when we went virtual, how many children were lost? How many children just fell under the radar because they didn't show up to school? And the, uh, count, the school systems, there's 115 uh, school systems across the state. LEAs. LEAs. And they're all saying that they lost zero to 1%. 
I've talked to too many teachers, the legislators have talked to too many teachers about kids not showing up virtually. And so I am in the throes of going to determine that at the request of a legislator, how many did we lose? Because think about this, and I'm looking at it for the, the, fisc the school year that was under COVID. And everybody says, well, Beth, that's, that's over with. That, that's over with, we're back in school now. No, it's not over with. All the children that were lost or didn't get the education that they needed are gonna suffer for many years to come. So we need to find out who they were, who they are, something about it. And then there's always um, the, all the, the, the influx of COVID monies. You know, the COVID monies are coming in from the feds to help the state recover from COVID and frankly, to be better than we were before COVID hit. So there's billions of dollars coming in. We've never been a great at disaster recovery money getting, we've been great at getting out the door. We haven't been so great at making sure that we got everything we were supposed to get for all the money that came in the door and we spent. So we are looking at what metrics are the people that are receiving the money, those that are giving it out, what metrics are you requiring to show that the, the true number of kids that should have been um, schooled in the, in the summer school were, what are you doing to show or what metrics are you asking for to show that once they went through summer school, their grades, their um, capabilities to go into the next class improved. Um, the COVID monies that are going out to cities and counties to be spent, what, what are you looking for from them to show not only that they spend on the right thing, but they accomplished absolutely, was there any waste? Was there any duplication of effort? Did they accomplish everything they could have with every dime they spent? So for the COVID monies, and again, the Employment Security Commission, DPI, and then all the federal money coming in the door, those are our three top priorities for probably in the next couple of years. For DPI, just for- We learned before COVID hit, that not necessarily are all of our school systems meeting the North Carolina required education standards. Now this is before COVID hit. So it's even more urgent to make sure that these kids that are being you know, moved from one grade to the next, that the capabilities and their competencies support that. So you are auditing in a sense like human capital in a way, it's not just financial numbers. Absolutely which is a huge so just for a brief moment because i'm going to shift back to the covid and i want to talk about ppp for a moment but with the how do you track individual kids to know do you get it down to an individual person and name and location or and how do you what's that process involve well we are um going all the way down to the individual schools so we're looking at what did dpi do to make sure no kid got lost, no child got lost. And then we're looking at the LEA at the district level. So right now I am in a particular county. I'm looking at what the, the superintendent's office did. And then whatever they tell me, I'm going into 46 individual campuses to see what was actually done. Because the General Assembly is gonna be asking me to do five more. So before I saw it was on the books and I thought this is a great idea. We need to learn about this sooner rather than later. It, it is a valid concern. So we jumped out there and we're doing a pilot project on a particular county. And like I said, I'm starting at DPI. I'm looking at the superintendent's office and then I'm looking at the individual schools. And I'm just telling you, peak preview, don't have this tied down, don't have, but, the initial look, it ain't good. Wonderful. All right, jumping into the COVID dollars as we talk about so much influx of money to the states. Can you talk about your office's involvement and generally about the PPP program? I mean, there's been certain levels where they've talked about, you know, the loans will be forgiven, particularly on smaller businesses and stuff. And who and if anyone is would be responsible for the audits on the larger organizations to ensure PPP has been spent correctly, been, the loans are getting repaid appropriately, those sorts of issues? It, that, Jeff, my responsibility 
is really at the state level. So who gave it out? How well did they monitor it? And then I write them up. The proof is in the pudding though, to move on to the organization that actually got it. And should they have, are they on that list that should pay it back? Um, and so we have not decided, I am always one not to just talk about the controls and did they do their job well enough. Um, if we see that the controls were not there and they didn't really monitor the spending, they didn't really go back and look and see were these people really eligible because I'm hearing these rumors that people got it they shouldn't have. Um, we are more than likely um, gonna go down to that next level that shows how bad or not this is. Sure. Two, two big funds, two areas that we set aside monies for the future in the state, uh, particularly for state employees, teachers, et cetera. And maybe if you can give us a quick overview of the state of those, the one is the pension uh, plan for retirement funds and the other is the healthcare plan. Can you give us a little insight to where we set with both of those? Wow, the pension, the pension fund is in great shape. We are, pro we are um, the second healthiest in the nation. But now I caution people to say that um, it doesn't necessarily mean anything good to me to be the best of the worst. So um, we have billions of dollars that are not funded to our pension plan. And we are on the hook for those monies. And so, it's what, like something in the $90 billion neighborhood or something? We're over a hundred billion now no. in total, but we are still, I think it's about 50 billion I can't, 30 billion, somewhere in that neighborhood, 40 billion underfunded, but it's owed. So somewhere along the line, we're gonna to have to come up with the money. So the treasurer and I serve on a, a commission with him is um, asking the General Assembly every year, you need to be funding this. So down the road, it doesn't get so big and it hits so hard. Right now we can cover, you know, all those that are retired, we can cover it beautifully. Um, but one day, if we're not funding it, that's not going to be the case. And that's going to come from uh, the taxpayers having to fund that. So the General Assembly needs to be appropriating some money along those lines. The health plan, we, we are eating up our reserves um, because we are paying more than we're taking in. And healthcare costs, the treasurer has done a phenomenal job of trying to get his arms around healthcare costs. Um, but again, many their contracts are protected. Um, and for instance, um, and, and our, insurance, um, our, our insurance will be paying a different price at one hospital for, let's say an appendectomy that they're paying, then they're paying at another. One will be higher than another. And for all practical purposes, the appendectomy should be pretty close to the same price, whatever hospital. But we can't get our arms um, around this. And, and um, it's been, um, said that these insurance companies are um, off better prices to businesses um, off the backs of the state of North Carolina's insurance uh, health plan. Um, mm -hmm. In other words, they are, we are paying more than we should out of our health plan for, and, and it's lowering the rates of some private businesses. So, but again, really hard to get our arms around because there's so much protection around the contracts that are being written and the agreements between insurance companies that we use and insurance and the same insurance company that other businesses use. Is, is it accurate that the health plan is one of the biggest concerns because it has fairly significant unfunded liabilities? Like it is absolutely one control. of the biggest concerns um, for myself and, and the treasurer, absolutely. Kind of jumping a little bit to IT, which is get my nerd going here this morning because uh, working around it, it's interesting. You talk about spend because all the departments, as you know, kind of keep track. And I tried to get a, a, an accounting, if you will, for lack of a better term, to get what do we really spend in aggregate, which is almost a number that's impossible. But it's like almost two, it's over two and a half billion dollars if you add it all. It's a big number. And we've done things. And I'd love your insight because I know you've worked with NC Tracks, 
when that process project went and it was like 450 million overrun tims the tax information management system we custom built it was 100 million and like at 30 days before go live they put it in a trash can because it wouldn't work and then we signed a non-disclosure and, and non-disparaging agreement with the vendor that we wouldn't say bad things about them <laughs> and yet we paid them yes uh, which is how does that stuff happen? How do we get our hands around that? Where's the accountability for all these overruns? NCDOT, I think a lot of that was the increased payroll. Uh, how does that get by without checks and balances? Or what um, do we need to do to rein that in? Well, for the IT side of it, um, there has got to be more oversight somehow, some way with DIT. It doesn't matter. So the state of North Carolina is entering, getting ready to put into play um, a new financial backbone um, accounting system. It's, it's new basically. ERP system. Yes, but it's, the, it's just the financial piece. There's more to right. come, but it's just the financial piece. And so, and that's going to be a canned package. Um, and then, like you said, with NC Tracks, that was built. But no matter, and you know this, I'm speaking to the choir, um, no matter which way you go, there are protocols for identifying your needs, identifying and, and moving through different phases, whether you build it or buy it. And there is nobody overseeing these different phases to stop it at a point where things can be fixed. And I'll just tell you for the financial uh, backbone replacement, um, we're entering, um, it's gonna cost us $120 million. And the project itself went out there and we sat down and had a, um, what's your pain point? With this accounting system, what brings you pain? What, what, what do you have to work around? Well, there's no forward thinking in that process. And we brought it, I've been auditing this project um, all along incrementally. We brought it to their attention and said, this is a 25 year old system. We need a system that's forward thinking, that can handle data analytics, that can handle cost accounting, that can break out how much we're spending in security or IT, how much we're spending in software, how much we're spending in hardware, all of this. But I'm going to tell you that new accounting system didn't address any of the forward thinking stuff. There's got to be somebody to oversee the controller's office, DHHS, whoever it is, to make sure they're going through the right steps, the right protocols because standards have it listed. They have it, there, there are standards out there by which you should implement either one of these, build or buy, but it's not happening, Senator Tart, it is not happening. So DIT has got to start stepping in and they have not and watching over these projects. Um, the new one that DHHS is doing is about to go live in a year and I just found out about it. There is no real tracking of these hundreds of millions of dollars of projects and it has got problems we're getting allegations in my office somebody has got to be aware of all the software being built or bought to be added to our system and state government and then somebody's got to be tracking the implementation whether built or bought and then there's got to be consequences for a a, a um agency to overspend and run out of cash because you weren't managing well enough, there's got to be consequences. Now I'm gonna say the secretary in place at DOT at the time, gone, the chief financial officer, gone, the chief engineering officer who made the decision, not the lawyers, who made the decision to, to go out of compliance with the law, gave all these big raises, he's gone. So some consequences there, not, I think, enough because everybody was allowed to resign versus getting fired. Um, but again, at least the, the troublemakers, the problems, the, the, the source of the problems are gone. This is something I don't know and curious about. Is there a compliance officer at, overall in the state or within the individual departments that are responsible for compliance? Some do, some don't. The biggest um, fix to all of this 
is if um, back in 2007, and I may have been in the General Assembly at that time, um, you passed a, a Internal Audit Act. Um, that is where the real um, finding out of these things that I'm naming off to you before I ever get there is your Internal Audit Department. We have 186.25 internal auditors. We spend close to 20 million a year directly on salaries and benefits. And this, the program does not work. It is so broken. I have been working with the legislature because they should be assessing the risk of all the things that I'm telling you about should show up in the risk. If um, EOT, internal auditors were in there looking at budget versus actual and how are they monitoring the 14 divisions and is anybody spending again? That's low hanging fruit that an internal auditor could find. And I'll give you an example. In uh, DOT's internal audit, looked at contract letting at the 14 divisions across our uh, um, state, the DOT highway divisions. There were, there, uh, we looked at contract letting, or they did, internal audit looked at it. And they said, generally speaking, they are doing a good job of contract letting. So the General Assembly asked me to go back and look at their work, and it, it was awful. We, the um, DOT requires that when you let a contract or people bid on a contract, vendors bid on a contract, DOT is supposed to do an estimate to see if the bids are in alignment. DOT was letting the vendor do their work for them and then DOT employees turned it in. And yet, and yet DOT's internal audit said, generally speaking, they're, they're, they're meeting the requirements. We found so many problems with that internal audit, so many problems. And the bottom line is the 14 divisions are not letting contracts. The pre-contract um, period, the pre-contract work is not being done like it should be. That is the true conclusion. Mm. And here, this internal audit division went and told the General Assembly legislative oversight for DIT, Yep, they look good, doing a good job. Of course. I'm going to shift a little bit and we're kind of getting close on our time, but uh, Medicaid, um, what's your involvement around that program? What's the thoughts? I mean, it has been an issue for a long time, particularly between the governor's office and the general assembly. And just, can you give us your take and thoughts? And For a long time, I um, said, that you should never expand Medicaid until you get the program fixed. There are so many problems in Medicaid. We were overspending um, our budget at the state, I don't know, five, 600 million, five or 600 million because of the lack of oversight in Medicaid and the lack of tracking and doing a good job. I believe they, they have got that under control. Um, and then we started looking at the eligibility determinations well, I can't tell if people are truly eligible or not because federal law prohibits me from looking at the state's tax returns hmm. to determine. I could do some great data analytics, but uh, the federal law, federal government prohibits me from looking at um, state tax returns to determine if I got people receiving Medicaid that shouldn't. I have now moved on to um, are the doctors and, and dentists and in-home health care providers, any provider to Medicaid, are they eligible? We found we had about, I don't know, 18 doctors that were per performing services on um, Medicaid clients getting paid. One got paid $11 million and they're not, they've lost their license. Mm -hmm. That's prompted me to now go look at um, the board of um, medical board once you take somebody's license, aren't you checking up to make sure they're not practicing? So we are, we're still moving through um, what um, we're moving through and looking at um, providers, what they're charging, making sure, I mean, there have been instances in other states where um, dentists have charged for the extraction of 32 teeth in a child, the child only had 20 teeth. Um, doctors, putting in, uh, psychiatrists putting in, they were, you know, just 
a horrendous amount of hours. But when you do the analytics, there's no way they can see that many patients in the course of it. So we are moving over the next couple of years, those kinds of data analytics to start looking at uh, provider fraud. So are you directing fraud investigations? And if so, you know, med medical insurance, tax frauds, is, do you work across with DOR and HH, DHHS and that, or is that just solely your responsibility? We find it and then we refer it. If it's um, tax issues, um, we'll refer it to the IRS and, and DOR. If it's um, fraud, we refer it to the SBI or the FBI, um, depending on the, the, you know, where the jurisdiction is. Sure. Well, and we're currently referring some things right now to the FBI and the SBI um, on some local government issues where uh, finance officers, town managers are, are stealing from their local government. All right, Madam Auditor, inquiring minds want to know, what <laughs> what's a typical week look like in the life of Beth Wood? I am attending many meetings. I move through the process of my discretionary audits, whether it's an investigation, uh, well, they're not discretionary, but my investigations and discretionary audits like performance. I am involved all along the way at specific increments so that I can be apprised of and know where these uh, investigations and audits are headed. I am speaking to groups to let uh, Rotary clubs, Lions clubs, um, Civitan clubs know Neighbors. what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and chambers, what's going on in your state government. Um, and meaning uh, for strategy uh, meetings, um, just had an all day meeting with my executive staff to work through the strategies for our agency. Um, and so uh, my calendar is booked up day in and day out, because I am involved with the General Assembly. I'm involved with the audits in my agency. It's why I can get up and talk about them as well as anybody who is on the audit. I am ensuring irrefutable. I'm making sure that the controls are in place, that our findings are irrefutable, and then I have a lot of speaking engagements. Okay, so, and we'll see here in a second if anybody else has something to chime in. But for, for my last actual question is, what do you do for fun? You sound like my brother, you just work. I, I am Shatter, and uh, my husband teaches Shatter lessons. So we dance a lot, and and I love I love to dance, and and so we dance a lot. I love to play cards. Um, I'm very competitive. I used to be on a softball team, a bowling team. That I doesn't surprise me for some reason <laughs> that you're competitive. I used to play racquetball, but at 67 years old, I can't handle all that anymore. My body just can't handle that anymore. So I, I'm shagging and, and I play in a, a lot of legitimate uh, Texas Hold'em tournaments. Oh, nice, poker player. Well, uh, okay. I've got one person who would ha has something to, and I don't know if it's just a saying hello or might actually have a question, but uh, someone you may know, uh, Mr. Jay Leesman, who was one of the past presidents of the CPA Association for the state, one of our past uh, presidents of our uh, local chamber of commerce as well. Jay, good morning. Good morning and hello there, Miss Wood. Good morning, Jay. It's great to see you. Um, I'm a big admirer of you and all that you've accomplished. I appreciate your continued support. Um, it, it, it's, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. Well, we, I have enjoyed, I, I've enjoyed knowing you. I mean, heck, we've known each other over 10, 15 years, I think. Yes. And um, just to, you know, to, to add to what Beth said in the very beginning, I just want to reiterate, you all don't know what state of affairs, the office that she holds, what all was not going on before she came in. Uh, you know, it was it was not pretty, <laughs> I guess, to say the least. And, you know, the fact that you're not required to be a CPA to be the state auditor doesn't make sense. Um and so, you know, Beth, I just want to say thank I remember when you went before you even were in office to begin with, you were talking about the wages that were paid to your staff or to the staff of the state auditor. And they were just coming and going, coming and going because there was no reason to stay. And you've got good people there now. Uh, she's done, you know, there's a lot of things that I know that your office does that no one really ever hears about, but you're not afraid also to take on the big uh, you took on your your alumni. I mean, your uh, 
the school you went to that you got your degree from. Um, exactly. And so, you know, Beth is, she's competitive, but she also says what she'll do and she does what she says. And I just want to say thank you. And because I don't know how much longer you're going to keep running, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm a Republican, but yes, I voted for you. So. <laughs> I appreciate and, that so much, Jay. And, and your support means a lot for the fact that you're a Republican and Senator Cardon. Well, thank you. I just, uh, I just want to say hello and thank you for coming today. And when I, you know, this whole Zoom thing has added a whole new dimension on people we can get to, to speak for us or with us. So um, thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm an admirer and we'll stay one. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. It's good to see you. All right, Madam Auditor, the last thing, just, uh, you know, we appreciate you being here. You cannot believe, I mean, you're somebody I hold in high regard and your credentials and what you've done for the state and turning this office around and the hours, endless hours, uh, and someone, again, implicitly trust and look to uh, for guidance. But any last things you would like to uh, leave us with or anything we didn't ask we should have or anything you want to, again, final thoughts, and then we'll let everybody get on with their weekend. Um, no, I, I mean, your, your questions were great. Again, I, I love what I do. Um, it's my plan to run at least, it's my plan to run one more time. And I will just say this, Senator, I am so excited um, at your position on the DIT Strategy Board. Um, as you heard me say, IT is in, in a, in a, got a lot of problems in the state of North Carolina, and your expertise is going to mean a lot. So I'm very excited about the fact that I'm going to continue to work with you and that I'm going to continue to work with you in the position you have now, because I believe going to add a lot to the um, the state of North Carolina and our technology issues. All right, I'm Adam Otter. I appreciate it. With that, I will flip it back to you, Bill. Jeff, we just wrapped uh, also candidate forums in all three North Mecklenburg counts, Cornelius, Davidson, and Huntersville. Uh, the chamber is nonpartisan. We don't endorse candidates, but we encourage everybody to please go out and vote. It's going to be a low turnout uh, because the, the local town elections are really the only things on the ballot. But those elected officials uh, that we elect are making some significant decisions for our towns uh, in terms of quality of life, our, our, our communities, our businesses. So please go out and vote for the candidates that, that represent you, best represent your view. So please do that. Um, Jeff, we have our public safety luncheon next Thursday, where we're going to be recognizing the outstanding police and fire in each of the three North Mecklenburg towns, Cornelius, Davidson, Huntersville, and our Crime Stopper of the Year. Uh, so uh, we still have opportunities to register for that. Who's on deck for our next Focus Friday, Jeff? Yeah, it's next month we'll have uh, the President Pro Tem of the North Carolina Senate, uh, State Senator Phil Berger. So uh -huh. it'll be a pleasure. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have uh, closed out the budget, have one signed <laughs> and in place, and he'll be able to share the highlights. Well, thank you very much for moderating today. And, and Beth, thank you very much for taking time to join us and, and sharing the important role you play in Raleigh. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure. Have a great day at the lake, everyone. Take care. <laughs>